welcome to another Crosstalk. So um, we've been exploring this uh, strange season that we call Eastertide. And um, I know it definitely became a joke when I was up at Callum Grove that I just can't let go of things. I want to keep talking about Christmas when Christmas trees are gone. And I want to keep talking about Easter, even though Easter is far in the rearview mirror. But there's a reason for this. Um, in the uh, ancient, 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 from the beginning tradition of the church, um, Eastertide is a long period of time. And that's reflective of the experience of Jesus's friends mm -hmm. following Easter. At the very beginning of Acts, Luke tells us that for a period of 40 days after Easter morning, Jesus continued to appear to his friends and to uh, encourage them, to give them convincing proofs that he was alive and to tell them about the kingdom of God. Um, so it's this period of teaching, and I personally believe that many of the, the church's ideas about the future and the way that God works and uh, our ideas about what God is up to in the future all come from this period of Easter tide where Jesus was sharing with his friends this incredible inside knowledge. So um, we've been celebrating that time, but... That time is coming to an end because the 40 days after Easter are almost up and um, something hard happens at the end of those 40 days. What happened? Well, I guess it, it was hard in one sense, although Jesus had talked to the disciples about it. He had prepared them for it in many ways, just as he had tried to prepare them for the cross. They didn't really get that. But uh, I think he had prepared them for this event that came at the end of the 40 days, which was his, what we call the ascension. His, um, he was taken away from their physical presence um, and moves into this, this heavenly realm of, of reign and, and rule. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of reasons, I think the disciples were finding that hard to grasp, just like we find it hard to grasp as well. I think, you know, when we talk about these seasons, I think maybe some of the people that listen to us and share with us are wondering why are these guys always talking about the church year? But I think, you know, these significant events in the life of Jesus that, and I, I would prefer the word um, observe rather than celebrate. Uh, we do celebrate these great events, but we observe them and and, and dig into the truth, and it's that repetition year after year of this pattern of Jesus that start to form and shape us. So we're not just kind of following the church year because, well, we think that's a good thing to do necessarily, but we do this as a church body, marking all of these incredible events that open windows of spiritual understanding experience for us. And I think the Ascension is one of those incredible events that you know, it's not a major holiday. Actually, it comes on Thursday, which, you know, nobody's in, much in church on Thursday. And so, you know, the Sunday holidays, we kind of catch maybe sort of. But when this thing happens on a Thursday, we kind of miss it. Sure. Um, yeah, and just to, to add on to what you were saying about the importance of the church year, I think there is certainly a tendency um, in evangelical circles and Protestant circles. Um, you know, we're people who are, are interested in scripture, but in my experience, it tends to be a lot of inductive Bible study and it tends to be a lot of sort of verse by verse. What do I think about this? Yeah. And there's a, there's a benefit to that. Um, however, if that's as far as we ever get, then uh, we really cut ourselves off from the, the larger life of the church and the larger thought of the church. Mm. Um, and as it turns out, I think there's only so far that inductive Bible study can take us. It, it can tell us about, you know, things that we won't, but it, it doesn't give us big answers. And uh, there are some huge claims that the church makes about the nature of reality that we're just not going to get to if it's all by ourselves. And um, another thing that I think is really important is the church didn't come to these ideas um, kind of on their own, they came, they, they formulated these ideas as a response to experiences that they had. 
So why do we believe in the Trinity? Well, that's the experience of Jesus' friends. Why do we believe that Jesus is coming back? That's because of the experience of Jesus' friends. Why do we believe that Jesus is still alive today? Well, that's because of the experience of Jesus' friends. So um, beginning to understand these big conversations that the church has had through the ages, it is really important um, to our spiritual development, to our understanding of what God is doing in the world, and as a consequence, what God wants to do in our lives. Mm. So yeah, it's really important that we understand what these big events are and, and we understand the implications that they have um, for the ideas of the church and for our lives personally. Yeah. So even when you ask the question, what's the big event? I almost stumbled a little bit because to, to many, I think modern people, uh, it's easy to make the statement that after 40 days, Jesus left his disciples, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, as we say in, in the creed. It's easy to say that, but when I, I say that to modern people, I wonder if we really get the import of this idea that Jesus ascended into heaven. I mean, do you, do you think modern people really Oh, okay. I, I know exactly what that means. Yeah, I think it becomes a, um, a real bone of contention. Um, it's kind of like one of these Noah art thing. It's you can either believe it literally and, uh, you know, believe that Jesus floated up into the sky and that Jesus is going to float back down from the sky. Um, and so there's a, a large body of, of Christians who it's like, well, yeah, unquestionably, that's it. End of story. Um, and then you have a larger world that just says that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, what a stupid idea that Jesus floated up into outer space um, and is going to come back from outer space. Where did he float to? Which are all, I think, fair questions. Yeah. Um, and this, again, is the wonderful thing about uh, many, many, many centuries of the best minds of the church trying to understand these things and reflect on them. I think what Ascension is pointing us to is, is not that Jesus floated into outer space and that if we don't believe that Jesus floated into outer space, then, um, then we're somehow heretics or not true believers. <clears throat> and also to take this reality seriously that Jesus has gone somewhere and Jesus is going to come back. That's not a ridiculous idea. And this is not something that science uh, forbades us to believe. So I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, and I think the church has always been there in the middle, but it's difficult for us, again, without being very aware of those conversations to make sense of it. Yeah. So one of the things that we talked about is the difficulty that modern audiences have with the idea that Jesus has gone somewhere. And um, it's not helped, um, by the limitations that we have with language. Jesus went up. Um, and heavens is archaic language, um, but heavens has always just been a way to refer to the sky and the things that we experience in the sky. And uh, so it's unfortunate in some ways <laughs> that that's the best language that has been able to come up to us. Jesus has gone into the heavens. And, uh, and so it's easy for modern people to scoff. Oh, is Jesus in space? Is Jesus in the stars? And then you get all this ridiculous stuff. You know that nobody can live in space. And yeah. <laughs> you know, these ridiculous conversations like that. And these are supposed to be proof that it's all not true. Yeah. I think, you know, again, when we just don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but when we begin to reflect about the nature of reality itself um, for a couple hundred years, 300 years, Western minds have been sort of um, cast in this sort of prison of materialism that if we can't sense it with our five senses, it's, it's not existent. Well, let's back up for a little bit too. For many, many, many centuries after the founding of the church, uh, one of the deeply held ideas of Western thought is the importance of authority. And if somebody from a position of authority said it, then it must be true, or at least we should take their word for it. And so um, for many, many years, that's kind of the way that it was addressed. 
We may not know exactly what this refers to, but it comes from a place of authority, so we're going to accept it as true. Starting 400 years ago, even longer than that now, 500 years ago, um, you begin to get the voice of the critic, the skeptic becomes louder and louder and louder. Who says that you have authority? Uh, why should I trust anything that you have to say? And, uh, and this couples with an intense interest in the natural world and understanding how things work. And so it didn't take long to get to a place where people said, this is not something that normally happens. Uh, we can't conceive of what this might mean. Um, and authority means nothing to us. This must be untrue. And interestingly, science has brought us to a different place today. Yeah. If you're at all interested in physics and the conversations that are being had um, about the way the world is put together, the um, tiny, 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 tiny particles that make up the atoms, that make up the elements of the things that we know and love, um, is beginning to, to understand that there are possibilities that never could have been dreamed of before. Yeah. And so you find completely atheistic, completely secular scientists arguing with a straight face that there are, without a doubt, many dimensions in addition to ours that exist simultaneously side by side. Right. And that it in, in theory, you can switch between the dimensions. Of course, heaven can't be real, but these dimensions definitely are. Yeah. <laughs> so you find those old uh, dichotomies um, breaking down, but the skepticism and the the refusal to accept authority, that's still deeply ingrained in modern thought. Yeah, and I, I think also it's, it's wonderful for us not, you know, I think it's good to think about, well, science sort of opens the door to this conversation that there might be other dimensions, uh, uh, other realities, but it's, it's wonderful to reflect back too on theological reflection really that comes out of scripture, this idea of heaven is God's sphere and sort of the earth is, is the human sphere. And in creation, the, the, the two were one, God's sphere moved uh, in harmony with the, the sphere of earth. And then of course, with sin, you have this severing of the ties of earth and heaven. But as we run on through scripture, we see the vision that comes at the end of the book of Revelation is that heaven and earth are reunited in, 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 in and through Christ. And so there's going to be a day when these realms uh, begin to move in harmony. Heaven will always be God's sphere. Earth will always be the human sphere. But uh, one day we're, we're gonna be able to see these, these different dimensions come together. So that's a, that's a little bit of reflection on you know, this, this modern idea. I think um, the, the Ascension brings that discussion, puts it on the table. I think there are no real intellectual problems to think in terms of Christ moving in, in, in other places uh, than just the place that, that we experience. And so, but what, what is important then? Okay, Christ is moving into that realm. What's, what's at stake and what, what problems to present themselves when we finally get to that place where we go, okay, Christ is at the right hand of God the Father right. Almighty. So, you know, big ideas, ascension is this problem. And uh, we've talked a little bit about the modern problem. This is skepticism, it sounds ridiculous. Um, but even before modern thought, the ascension caused problems, and it, I think that it caused problems right from the very start. Um, the day that it happened, I think it left Jesus' friends scratching their head. Uh, going back to the idea that you just talked about, this biblical idea about different realms, um, heaven, again, it's unfortunate that the word means sky, but um, really what heaven is in the Old Testament is it's the realm where God's will is done perfectly. And uh, so there is no sin because sin is re rejection of God's will. Um, heaven is free of that. And because of that, heaven is free of death and all of these things. The earth that we know is separate. It's broken away from heaven. But again, you get this hope that heaven and earth will become one. That's the way that the Lord's Prayer begins. And this has always been understood as the vision 
um, that is born out of the Old Testament is that God is moving all things towards this time when heaven and earth become one. And more specifically, um, that, that age will be ushered in when God's king, Messiah, takes over because God's king, Messiah, will rule earth as God intends perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's a very basic Old Testament idea. And uh, one of the things that's so exciting about Jesus and Jesus' life is the good news that Messiah is here. And uh, what that means is that all of God's future that's tied up in the life of Messiah is also supposed to be here. So Jesus says things like, repent because the kingdom of heaven is on the way, is close, or it's actually here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this got the disciples really excited. That's why people came out to see Jesus. It wasn't because he was a, a nice teacher or a nice guy. It's because he's the hope for God's future. And uh, certainly Good Friday is a big bump, a big hiccup. And uh, say, how can we have a future if God's king is dead? And then Easter happens and it's this incredible vindication. And God's king is more invincible than we ever could have imagined. Um, and so, it's certainly going into Eastertide, the disciples have this idea that it's all going to happen now. And then after 40 days, Luke tells us that they're actually in the middle of a conversation when Jesus leaves. And Luke tells us what the conversation is about. The disciples are with Jesus, and they ask him this question, Is it time for the kingdom to be restored to Israel? In other words, is God's future heaven and earth coming together going to happen now and jesus's answer is typically frustrating it's not for you to know you've got work to do as my ambassadors uh in my uh faithful diplomats and then in the middle of this conversation jesus disappears <laughs> And then there, the disciples are met with the angels. Why, why are you looking around? He told you what to do. Right. Go do what he asked and just know that he's going to come back to finish the work. But there's this huge crisis. We thought that everything was going to happen, that heaven and earth were going to become one, and they haven't. And we're waiting. Jesus said, go do this stuff, but we're waiting for him to come back and finish the work. That's the big problem that the dissension really causes. There's a fancy term for it. It's called the delay of the parousia. Uh, parousia means Jesus' return. Um, and as that first generation of Jesus' friends waited and waited, Jesus didn't come back. And the second generation, Jesus didn't come back. And the third and the fourth. And 2,000 years later, Jesus hasn't come back. And we're left with this question, Jesus, when are heaven and earth going to become one? Were we mistaken somehow? So that's, that's really the big problem that comes with ascension. Um, but as with all things, this hard experience of Jesus' friends, um, uh, through grace, they're able to, and through prayer, um, they're able to come to some conclusions about what might be going on and what it means for them as Jesus' faithful followers. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. It, you, it takes time for the followers of Jesus to reflect on his words and work through what they perceive to be challenges or problems. But I think even uh, Luke's account of the, the day of the ascension gives us some insight into how little we understand, um, you know, the disciples' questions, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? I think they were still thinking in terms of ethnic Israel being sort of the center of this power pyramid, and, and they were thinking in terms of, of uh, restoring the kingdom to Israel. They were thinking of you know, a regional kind of geographic expression of this kingdom through a particular people. And when, you know, they were thinking of a specific time. I think Jesus must have smiled and thought, you know, boys, you're just thinking way, way, way too small. I mean, because this, this kingdom idea, as the church has had time to reflect on it through the centuries, 
um, is much larger. And Jesus even sort of tried to spell that out for him. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. This is a global kingdom. It, it's, it's going to extend through time, and somehow time is going to be uh, not just a linear experience, but something we experience together. Jesus is, is pushing us again to the limits of our, our imagination. And as C.S. Lewis said, even at the limits of our desire it is so large and so big. And I, th we would I think settle for a lot less than God's actually putting on the table. Yeah, he, God's putting this huge thing out there and we're still trying to scramble around for, for a much diminished sort of idea like the disciples were mm -hmm. of what the reign and rule of Christ might look like. Yeah, so let's start there. Uh, to me, there's three real um, takeaways that the church has after ascension and the first is this idea of the reign and rule of christ which begins even now um but will sort of be finalized when jesus returns mm -hmm. um so this happens relatively quickly already in paul's lifetime and paul is a first generation believer um already in paul's lifetime he's throwing around these ideas so when we come to a book like ephesians paul is already talking about this idea that jesus has moved on and that Jesus' work now is to put all things under his feet, is consolidating his reign and rule. And um, there in Ephesians, uh, we certainly have um, the issue of the human heart. And Paul says it's our job to give ourselves over to Jesus' reign and rule. But Jesus is also fighting with things like the, the rebel forces. Um, sometimes we might call them... Uh, gods and goddesses certainly in ancient world and other cultures they do uh, we might call them demonic powers or we might just call them uh the real world market forces um i hate that word market forces such a such a bs idea um and it sells market forces short um aphrodite is still mighty um the god of war, Ares, is still bloodthirsty, mm -hmm. and, and the god of wealth is still alive and well. Call him market forces. That's not fair to the god of wealth. But um, all of these powers, Paul says, Jesus is wrestling with them too. And that's, that's something that's happening in the heavenly realm. But Jesus is at work with them too, and he is going to put them all under his feet. And Jesus' rule will be consolidated when he returns. Um, so that's a reality. That's what, what is Jesus doing right now? Jesus is busy. And that's not meant to be flippant. Um, that's not meant to be a put off like, ah, your kid, sorry kids, your parents are busy. Um, it's this reality that there's a lot of work to be done. A new creation to be formed uh, and all of these rebel powers to be um, subdued. And the witnesses that Jesus is doing that. He's moved on to this bigger work. Um, and then the, the promise of Jesus' return. Um, it becomes another big deal. We still wait for Jesus to come back. He didn't float off into nowhere. He didn't leave us um, never to return again. He said, I'll be back. When the time is right, I'll be back. Well, and, and also I think perhaps one of the, the things that we wrestle with when we think in terms of the reign and rule of Christ. Uh, we sort of look around and, and even those followers of Jesus who would give assent to this reign and rule, I think there's this sneaking suspicion in the back of our heads, well, if he's reigning and ruling, why are so many bad things going on? Right. And one of the things that we've been talking about is, is the nature of Christ's rule we, we tend to think in terms of this uh, conquest by power. And so- Oh, that's think, the only way that we can think about it. I'll come in and stomp you and you'll have to obey me. Yeah, and I think that's what we're looking for in, in Jesus. Uh, you know, this, this warrior coming in on a horse to, you know, just slay his enemies. But even though that sort of is a picture in the book of Revelation, we, we get a whole nother side of that in Revelation and certainly in the life of the church. Right. He, 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 he just seems to want to conquer by love. Well, here's problem. the thing. Even in Revelation, Jesus conquers, but the people he conquers don't submit to him. They just end up being destroyed. 
Um, I think one of the wonderful things about Western thought, um, in particular about modern Western thought, is this realization, uh, this um, uh, eureka moment um, that was had in the 17th, 18th century, um, that in order to be governed well, people have to want to be governed. You can go in and try and impose your will, but really if people don't want it, I mean, if it's passive aggression or if it's all out rebellion, people will not accept your rule unless they want to. Uh, it's, uh, the, um, social contract is the idea for this. And God seems to be well aware of this. I, I can't rule you unless you want me to rule you. So, um, Jesus' reign and rule, the return of Christ. The other idea that the church really comes up with is this idea of forbearance. Why is it taking so long? And the answer that the church comes up with is it's forbearance and grace because God is going to give people as much time as possible to submit to his rule, to begin to want his rule, um, because God can't govern people who don't want to be governed. Yeah, and, it, and it's not so much a matter of God can't. I think, you know, what you said about the book of Revelation is, um, is interesting in that God, you know, if, if we oppose God, we'll end up being destroyed. I mean, so God can impose his will and it's destructive, but, but God chooses to forbear and, and, and God chooses not to, to force us. God chooses to invite us into this relationship. And again, this pulls us back into this big scope of what God is up to. Um, it's not about personal salvation only. Um, personal salvation is our part in the story, but that's not God's vision, is that we'd be a bunch of individuals up in heaven doing our thing. It's the reconciling of heaven and earth, and it's the reordering of a creation that's geared towards life. And we're invited to become participants in that. Do you want to be part of a creation that is ordered by life? If so, you've got some responsibilities. It's not something that's just going to happen for you. It's something that's going to happen with you. And you're going to have to be part of the process. And so again, you have this idea. When we submit to God's rule, we prepare ourselves. We make ourselves candidates for life in this creation that is ordered towards life. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a work that God does. The rule and reign of Christ is a work that God does in us and also through us into the world. And that for seems to be creation. for creation. That's, that's kind of a big deal. And it's kind yeah. of wonderful if you think about it. Yeah, and you get this idea, again, a strong idea in the Old Testament that the fate of creation is really tied to human beings. And when we do well, creation does well and when we do poorly creation suffers and so it's this move god's like i'm god loves god's creation and god's going to get it back on track but it, it won't happen without us so you have this idea of forbearance um god leaving as much time as possible for as many people as possible to willingly submit themselves to his rule he's not gonna uh, twist on him um but God's future will happen. So, um, again, this idea of forbearance tied with the idea of Jesus' return becomes very important for the early church. Yeah. And it also brings us to this place of um, personal responsibility. I think one of the early understandings of, of the early church is um, these things are going to happen. We trust that Jesus is going to come back and that all of these things will occur. What's my job? My job is to be the best citizen that I can be. The best citizen of God's kingdom. The best subject of Christ that I can be. Um, and they begin to take the way that we live every day very seriously. And so then you get back into your teaching, I think, on, on Sunday, which was just fantastic. Um, Paul uses language like he sent... The Holy Spirit is a down payment or something, you know, like that on, on what's coming. And so the Holy Spirit is working with us like the spotter on the weights, um, training us, getting us ready for our role. 
And so we experience a little bit of that, that future reign and rule as God the Holy Spirit comes into to our midst. Not the, it's not the whole package. Paul says it's a down payment. It's a, a wedding ring placed on our finger. I mean, an engagement ring, not the wedding ring. But um, God is, is present working toward that end, and we sense it. Yeah. And uh, so three reactions that the church has to, to ascension. Um, the reign, the present reign of Christ and the return of Jesus become important. Forbearance becomes important. And then the last is sort of this age of the church. Uh, and it's an age that is empowered by, made possible by, driven by the life of the Holy Spirit, um, active in God's people. And again, forming them into the kind of people that can live in God's future, but also bringing God's future into the present. Um, when we submit ourselves to the reign of Christ now, and that life is able to flow through us to the world around us and bring light and life where there is darkness and death, uh, that's Jesus' reign. That's heaven on earth happening even now. So it's a little bit of a foretaste of what's coming even now. And the church has always held on to those moments with uh, special excitement. Because again, like Paul says, these are down payments. These help us know that it's not all naive, it's not all ridiculous, it is not impossible. That in fact, it is going to happen. And these should encourage us, their taste of what's to come. I think, um, you know, the importance of the ascension is really elevated in this conversation for me. Um, Christ is, is ultimately going to come back and the reign and rule is going to be established in heaven and on earth. Um, but we do get these foretastes, as you said. <laughs> but, you, you know, I think you, we don't get any glimpse of that in any real sense if our mind is just trained on as Paul says, earthly things. Um, and by that, I just mean earthly things. I mean, if, if, if our diet is secular entertainment, secular information, secular whatever, we're not going to see the reign and rule of Christ. But as we start to, you know, get a little bit of kingdom look, I mean, when we meet with people like Evans Paul or get together with... Um, Merle Menon or, or have conversations. The, the with, work that Feed the Hunger is doing, feed, not just to feed hungry people, but the uh, helping people get out of sex trafficking in Southeast Asia. These are big things. These, these are huge things, and, and, and they are going on every day. Um, this is not special stuff. It's not unusual. Um, these kinds of kingdom ministries are at work, and and as you said, you know, we get a chance to resist on a personal level the kingdom of darkness and see Christ rule and reign in us. But we have these very, very real opportunities to jump in um, and, and to support all of these kingdom works that are going on. You begin to bump into kingdom people all over the world that do speak many, many different languages and come from many, many different cultures. But they all, uh, we are all joined together in this kingdom. And I'm saying, well, you know, in spite of any intellectual barriers or in spite of any theological barriers we might have, maybe this kingdom thing and Christ's reign and rule is, is not so crazy after all. No, I think the burden of proof um, is always on the negative. Um, and to me, there's not a real good argument against it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of disappointment. There's a lot of frustration. But none of those are the same as this can't be true. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some might be saying, well, okay, guys, you've been talking about this, but where do you get it? It's in Scripture. Well, to me, it's just the New Testament drips with it. But on Sunday, we're going to be looking at Romans 8, favorite chapter for a lot of people for a lot of really good reasons. But, you know, there's that incredible little phrase in there that Paul says, you know, the creation has been uh, subjected to groaning and it's waiting on tiptoes for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. That's, that's quite, a, uh, quite a statement. Right, right, right. Um, and again, that's this, this big picture. Um, yeah. 
of what God is up to is so much bigger than, than any of us could imagine and so much better. Yeah. And, you know, when I think of that Romans 8, I don't want to get into it too, too much uh, tonight. We'll get into it on Sunday. But this idea that, that creation is, is groaning and broken, but God has his sons and daughters somehow involved in this reclamation and reign and rule. And part of that is, is difficult for, for the children. We also groan. But then it gives me the confidence when we get down to 828 where Paul says, you know, in spite of how everything looks, even, even if things are just totally disintegrating, we know that in all things, God works for the good uh, for those who are called according to his purposes. I mean, God, God is turning even what we think is, oh, that, that can't be a good thing at all. God is going, well, it, it may not be good in itself, but it's not outside of his reign. It's not outside of his rule. He's going to use it to advance the kingdom. The good end will be accomplished. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's encouraging to me, and I need that encouragement every day these days. Yeah. So um, as we uh, come towards this Sunday, again, we're exploring the work of the Holy Spirit um, and, and this kind of thing that the Holy Spirit calls us into, this common life, common life we share with the Trinity and with each other um, as we look forward to the redeeming of all things. Um, the Holy Spirit who empowers us to become uh, active participants, uh, to become good subjects for Christ, um, and good candidates for future life. Um, but also the Holy Spirit who is, uh, whose heart is for creation. Yes, all creation groans, and the Holy Spirit groans with it. Mm -hmm. um, and the Holy Spirit who, who yearns for and is dragging um, all of us towards God's future. It is a, if we can silence the inner critic for a little bit, it becomes the kind of news that makes all of us smile. Yeah, yeah. Romans eight twenty eight, I'm sure, has, has gotten a lot of people through a lot of scrapes to the other side where you look back and go, oh, that was true. It was reliable. Well, um, please come and join us on Sunday. We'll talk a little bit um, about the Ascension, but we'll also be exploring the Holy Spirit and what does life look for us now as we wait for Jesus to come back. Right. Amen. Will you say a prayer to close us up? I will. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess uh, one day. But even now, we thank you for many who uh, are bending the knee and confessing, not because of fear or because of your mighty power, but Lord, who are bending the knee and confessing because you are the Lord of love and full of grace and mercy made new to us every day. And Lord, we thank you that uh, love conquers where no uh, sword could ever uh, make any inroad. Uh, we thank you that uh, you are reigning and ruling. We, we invite you to reign and rule in us, in our church, in our homes, in our community. And Lord Jesus, we do look forward to that day of your return where uh, all things are made well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Good night.